live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all new edition of the ODPH Podcast. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. You know my co-host very well. He is a statistician to the stars. His name is Padawan J. Oh, let me talk to you. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about in the land of movies, TV, comics, and more. You are tuned in to the entertainment edition of the ODPH, and we definitely want to keep that conversation rolling after the show. So, Pad, where does everybody go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. You swing on over, sign up for all the social media accounts. We're definitely interacting with everybody there and keeping those great conversations rolling through the weekend until the next episodes. That's kind of what we do here. That's how the ODPH system. Society works. Also, check out the T Public Store link. There's always something going on there. You never know when a new design is coming. Hmm. Stay tuned. Dot dot dot. Also, check out the blog section of the show where we have reviews dropping left and right. The Classifieds, which has friends of the show such as 3FM Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, and many more. And one notable link that we definitely want to keep plugging until. Uh, It's November, and that is voter registration in the United States. So wherever you're at, just make sure you go out and register to vote and make your voice heard at the polls this fall. Also, the directory. Pat, how many providers are we on? 639,967. See, when I say statistician of the stars, I'm not lying. He he can just whip that up like nobody's business, and Uh, it's all true. Source, trust me, bro. Trust me, bro. That's why I say we can't go wrong with that. So wherever you listen to the ODPH on, we do appreciate it. Drop a review on your favorite podcast or let us know what we're doing. And it helps boost the algorithm of the show because we want more people to get involved in the conversation, much like yourself. Also, check out the music section of the show where you can find out about great bands such as Brian Wolf and the Howlers, Second Suitor, Tom Jolu, Floodlands, Shout of the Robots, all amazing bands that you need to have in your music playlist. And anything else basically is the odphpodcast.com. And you can also just run around social media use the hashtag odphpod. I'm so amped up to talk about the show that we're going to kick off with. Pad, what are we leading off the Entertainment Edition with? We're going to be talking about the Netflix hit series uh, that just came out with its fourth and final season. Of course, adapted from the phenomenally popular graphic novel of the same name uh, from the folks over at Dark Horse, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, The Umbrella Academy. Yes. The book from Gerard Way and Gabriel Bay. Uh, came out and really snuck under the radar for a lot of people. I mean, obviously, with Gerard's history being a very famous musician in My Chemical Romance, him doing a comic was going to draw some eyes to the project, whatever he's working on. And he has been very involved in comics pre-band and post now, too. And we definitely were gifted with a unique story that really transcends the page, if Mm -hmm. you will. Because on paper, you think it's going to be one thing, and then it turns out to be something else. And the story about one Sir Reginald Hargraves and how his uh, students, if you will, are trained to save the world and just how far things go from being the rose-colored glasses of optimism to just the sheer uh, broken nature that Mm -hmm. the unfortunate children are left in. It's really taken fans on a journey. The books have been very well, and when we heard the show was coming to Netflix – Everybody was very excited to see how the Dark For- Dark Horse Comics project would translate. Mm-hmm. And it has been very, very good. Mm-hmm. And barring from each of the volumes of Apocalypse Suite, Dallas, Hotel Oblivion, and now to the season four, which has been announced to be the finale, it definitely has generated enough buzz. So we are going to be breaking down the final season. Mm-hmm. Now... If you're new to the OPH, first and foremost, thank you for checking us out. We really do appreciate it. What we like to do is give you a spoiler-free statement about what we're going to be talking about. So if you haven't seen the season yet, you don't want to have anything ruined, but you want to get our gist of what we're talking about, we're going to give it to you. But we give you a countdown. At said countdown, you have a choice. You can stay and listen and join in the conversation. But we deep dive. We don't hold anything back. We give theories. We talk spoilers. Or you can pause the episode right here, and then when you catch up, jump back in. It's that simple. So that being said, Pad, what is your spoiler-free statement on Season 4 of Netflix and Dark Horse Comics, The Umbrella Academy? Uh, Well, first, I want to just say for the audience, we have not talked about this 
at all, uh, other, right. than, other than, hey, we're going to talk about it on the show this week. Uh, a couple of numbers here just for, you know, just for comparison's sake, because I feel like we're inevitably going to be talking about the show as a whole here at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got the Rotten Tomatoes numbers up for the you know, entire show, all four seasons. Uh, season one on Rotten Tomatoes from the critics earned a 77 uh, percent. That's with 94 reviews. Uh, and the audience score with over 5,000 reviews got 85%. So hey, not bad for your first season. Second season, uh, better. Uh, for the t- uh, critics score, it got a 91%. That is with 89 reviews. And then with over 1,000 plus uh, ratings from the audience, it got an 88%. So hey. Well, also pretty good. Uh, season three uh, on the critic side with 58 reviews got a 91%. And then the audience score with over a thousand uh, ratings got a 55%. Uh, and then you get to season four, which is the one that came out just last week uh, you, with 34 reviews on the critic side. Thus far, it is sitting at a 56%. And then on the audience side of things with over a, th- a thousand ratings, it is currently sitting in an 18%. My opinion on this season um, it's better than season three, not by much, but it, it feels unpolished. It really, to me, feels like it was rushed. It was, Hey, we got to get this out or else we're going to lose the rights or we're going to lose, you know, the ability to, to release this in some capacity. Kind of like how at the end before Disney officially acquired Fox, the Fox powers that be were just green lighting everything, mm-hmm. e- even stuff that made no sense. Like there were board games. I remember that were getting turned into movies that the heads of Fox studios were green lighting that I'm just sitting there going, why you're, you're making a Candyland movie. Like why? It just made no sense. But this one just, I enjoyed it. I, I'm not upset I watched it, but at the same token, it left me feeling a little disappointed just because I loved season one. Season two, to me, was the absolute best season of the entire show. You know, it was just a home run start to finish. Season three, not as good as the first two seasons. Four, slightly better than three, but but not by much. You know, unpolished thrown together just a whole lot of moments where i'm sitting there what why is this happening what are we doing here what is the purpose of this you know so a little bit of a flat ending for me but you know what i'm not mad i watched it you know pad i have to kind of agree with you Uh huh. see the one thing is gerard way's writing has always been very good good it's very layered it's very detailed no matter what he's done my chemical romance paranoid gardens which is out right now yeah or doom patrol uh to name a few and i thought for what we had here I, i'll kind of just borrow a little bit from game of thrones okay and just hear me out with the analogy i don't really think that there was like a definitive ending ready for the show uh-huh. and i think that it was just kind of loosely based on like we had hotel oblivion and then anytime we do the adaptation from the show, like I say, I, I don't think they had like a clear cut, like this is how it ends in the book. Right. Like that kind of vibe. Because I just feel that they went, and granted, I haven't read Hotel Oblivion in quite some time. Uh-huh. And with how the show ended, it was kind of like they kind of went their own route. Right. And I wasn't sure exactly how I felt about it. Right. And I think that it was a good setup, but I think at the end it was very... I don't want to say lackluster because I think that's too harsh. Okay. But I think it was just okay. Yeah, it, like it, it easily could have been better. It easily could have, you know, um, it's just like, I don't know. It, it's when you're talking a final episode of a show or, or final season of a show, especially one that's like superhero based and comic book based. You know, you're expecting something crazy. You're expecting a culmination of everything that's built up. They're going to tie off all of the story, all of the plot lines. You're going to get a couple callbacks to the first couple seasons. You know, just because the first season came out, what, like 2017, 2018? Mm-hmm. Some, somewhere around there. You know, and it, and it just felt like they were in the writer's room with the whiteboard and just throwing stuff up and, yes, do an episode on that. Yes, do an episode on that. Like, they just picked because there's six episodes in this season, it felt like they just took the first six ideas they had and go, listen, go with that. We're going to, you know, we're going to figure out how to connect it as we go along. You know, so it it definitely felt for me like flat that it could have been better. It could have been more polished. 
Yeah, that's the thing about it. I think that it was just one of the situations where we had to wrap up shop, but it was how are we going to do this? That or even like I don't know when they wrote this. I'd have to I'd have to dig into some of the online information but like were they coming up against the writers guild strike like was there something going on was it like we're on a time crunch and and we can't afford to pay the writers any more than we've already got them on staff and if we keep having them work on this show we're gonna have to pay them for a whole other session a whole other like six months or whatever like it just feels like there was something else going on in the background that led to this this season because you you think back to season three where it was it was hotel oblivion and it was all the insanity with that and they finally get back to what they think is the present time but oh just kidding you know their dad controls everything and he's you know they don't have powers and they're all hunky happy dory you know oh finally we're back together everyone's happy we can already finally live our happy ending you know oh but then you get the shot of their dad at the top of the the tower or office building whatever it is mm-hmm. and it's all oh, he's lording over all he's in control of everything and then it's just like we decided to not follow that at all we decided to ignore that and then just do whatever we want well that's the one thing about the series it's always been a little quirky to put it mildly mm-hmm. i mean ever since the tv show debuted in 2019 I had to go oh, research okay. that it's been a very unique experience when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I wasn't super shocked about that, but as we're going to get into the breakdown of everything, I think it was just more of we got into messing around with an unfinished script, like an unfinished ending. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like the interpretation of it because Sparrow Academy did not come out in print. Right. That's the last volume of the comic. Right. And when you kind of go off script, much like with Game of Thrones, and that's kind of what I was going with. Right. It's very hit or miss. In this situation, I think it's like literally right down the middle. You can take it or leave it. I just would have liked a little more with it. Uh, I would too. But that being said, I know I'm going to start spilling spoilers. So, Pat, let's just get into it in three, two, one. Let's really talk about it. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this this whole ending was just disappointing. It started off good. It started off interesting, and it definitely took some some interesting paths to get there. But there was just more often than not, I'm sitting there going, what the fuck, why, why is this happening? You know, Nick Offerman in, in, the, in the season was amazing, of course. When is he not amazing mm-hmm. in anything he's in? And I thought that whole plot line with, like, they're in the alternate timeline and we're delving into more of the timeline thing, because that's kind of what one of the undertones of this whole show has been alternate timelines and the ramifications of time travel. You know, I, I was fine with that, and I was and I was okay with, oh, there's this cult of folks who believe and and are starting to suspect that like hey things aren't what they should be we're remembering things that we shouldn't you know and and kind of this like con- online conspiracy thing which i'm like okay you know i can dig that like i can understand i can understand that and see where that's coming from but then just you had wholesale moments of like hey all of a sudden you know we're in we're introducing family members you know to to folks for the very first time, I, I mean, you you had who the heck was it? Uh, Lila, Lila, all of a sudden had a family out of nowhere, and I'm like, okay, why are we? This is the fourth season. Why are we introducing new characters? Like they had kids. Oh, you know, her her and her uh, her husband Diego had had kids. Okay, get that. Fine with that. They're together. They're a couple. They're a thing. Get that. But like, oh, we're gonna introduce. They have a family, and they're gonna feature in in the couple of the episodes there at the end. And I'm like, why are we doing this? You know. And then you get. Was it Diego and Luther joined the CIA and we have this whole plot line about them at the CIA, which I get in in the end. It played a part in the plot a little bit, but for the amount of time they focused on it, it wasn't that big of a plot point, you know, so just a lot of missteps with this season. Well, I think we just have to take a look at it as a whole. Yeah. And obviously with the mechanics of Sir Reginald Hargraves played by Colin Fior manipulating his quote unquote kids from, you know, Victor Hargraves, played by Elliot Page, who is more like the Phoenix Force. Kind of, yeah. Tom Hopper, who's number one, who is half man, half uh, gorilla mm-hmm. uh, to a certain degree. Uh, in the comic, a very different version of him. Right. David Castaneda, uh, who plays Diego Hargraves, who's kind of like the Batman uh, bullseye character, if you will. Yeah. Emmy Raver Lepin, who plays Allison Hargraves, whose power is possession or manipulation, uh, mind control. Who does when I I hear a rumor, and uh, we've seen kind of some variations of that power going on. 
Robert Sheehan, who plays Klaus, uh, who's probably the most popular character on the show, who's a very, very... Understandable reasons. Yes, unique person with uh, his uh, clairvoyancy, if you will. Uh, Aiden Gallagher, who plays number five, who is a very, very uh, scene-stealing character, uh-huh. uh, who can teleportate and is a uh, old man trapped in a young body. Mm-hmm. And then the mysterious member of the family, Justin Mim, who plays Ben Hargraves, who was killed before the season began uh, in season, season one. one and the mystery around him is kind of evolved where now season three he's back and it's alternate timelines and that's kind of something that the show has really not been afraid to dabble in right and that's one thing that we saw in the beginning of the season so this is where we're going to backtrack a little bit the show has really gone into diving into different timelines like they've messed with the jfk assassination era right well in dallas e- right even and even in the second season dallas with the jfk stuff like there was even a scene and i forget which episode it was it was like one of the first couple episodes where things had gone down differently in history and the soviet union was marching down main street in dallas texas mm-hmm. and i'm just like yo like this is really different but i'm digging this it's, it's a interesting perspective well that's something way does and you know he likes to push a little you know i want to say uniqueness to uh-huh. the story he does so i wasn't super shocked because it, it's loosely based on the book so when you do the comparisons you can find it right but to where we get now yeah the timeline was reset because of the actions they've done because with the sparrow academy crossing over and They've really dabbled into that, which, I mean, if you love the multiverse and alternate timeline stuff, there's something here for you. At this stage, it was kind of like, where are we going? And how we left everybody was like a hard reset where Sir Reginald is back alive when he was dead. And that's the whole reason the family came back together after all those years. So to see where everybody starts now, it really throws a lot of things off because we do see that there's a group called the Keepers involved. Mm-hmm. And that is the one that you alluded to with the show-stealing member of the, season, of the series. Nick Offerman. Yes. And how they're basically trying to cause the apocalypse, if you will. Well, I, I, it's weird because at the, start of this, at the start of the season, they're this like online message board group or, or whatever that like it's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge code word that there's a group of people online who are, who are having memories from times and places they have not been. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not talking, oh, you had a turkey sandwich for lunch last week on Tuesday when in actuality you had a ham sandwich. No, we're talking like. They've spent their entire life, and let's just say in this in this timeline in Los Angeles, but they remember having a fifth birthday in Miami, Florida. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's stuff like that. So, like, there there's people in the population on on this earth that are having memories that they don't remember that they know they didn't experience, but for some reason they're having them, and they're starting to come together and go. We need to really something, and they've come to the conclusion something's wrong with the timeline. We need to get back to where we're supposed to be. We have to reset the timeline. And I, and, I, and on the surface, I'm like, oh, okay. Like if suspending disbelief for a second with time travel and all, because obviously that's not real. Otherwise, we'd all know it by now. Yeah. You know, but or would we? Or yeah, true. Uh, but like suspending disbelief, I'm going okay. Plausibly, if I'm just taking everything on that that happens here at face value, of like okay. They're getting memories. They're getting stuff they shouldn't remember. Like, understandably, there'd be some folks who are like, oh, we got this. And what, we, what we're remembering is where we're supposed to be. So, you know, it makes more sense that way. Yeah, and when we start seeing that play out, uh, it, it's something that when it sets the tone for the show, for the season, I don't exactly know how we all kind of vibe about it. Because right. we see everybody's in a different place. Right, they're just living their life. Yeah, we see number one is now a male escort. Uh, dancer, yeah. Yep, Diego is now... A UPS driver? Uh, not a very good one. No. Allison is now a, a struggling actress, if you will. Uh, yeah, basically B-list or C-list being uh, put on national ad campaigns. Yeah. Klaus is now living with her and has now cleaned up his act. To yep. Now he's an extreme gerbophobic. Yeah, he is. But and, hey, good for him. And Ben is now um, more or less in and out of jail. Ben's Bernie Madoff. Let's call it what it is. Yeah, to, to put it mildly. So everybody and Victor is in Alaska. Yep. So everybody's out doing something different, but they get drawn together mm-hmm. because when the keepers are now getting involved, 
it's really causing this big conflict. They have yep. to get together. Ben winds up stealing the Marigold, which apparently gives them their powers. Yeah. And restores them back to their lives that they once had. Mm-hmm. So the hard reset that happened with the paradox of season three has now been wiped away. Yep. We now all have powers. They're now getting driven to go find this mysterious uh, woman named Jennifer. Uh, yeah. And we don't exactly know what is her deal. She is, she's, the, she's the red herring. She's the MacGuffin. She's the whatever term you want to use. She's, she's the end goal. Mm-hmm. So the group winds up escaping uh, this very small town, which is absolutely insane and protecting them f- or protecting Jennifer from somebody. Yeah. But they wind up taking her. And there is a connection with Ben that we don't know about. Yep. And are trying to see how this plays out. Yep. So the group winds up splitting after they have one of their trademark violent action sequences go down. Yeah. All to the sounds of Baby Shark. <laughs> and Ongoing song for this season, which, interesting choice. Well, it, Not it, my it, cup of tea, but... It, it fits the quirkiness of the show. Mm-hmm. And as we see as it progresses forward, half the group is now looking for Ben and Jen. Yep. The others go back to see this version of Hargreaves, mm-hmm. which is <laughs> oh, boy. somewhat different, somewhat same. Uh, it's time travel. We just like to define it as what pad reasons, but they do get some information that they need to know that this Jennifer was apparently made up of the chemical compound that is opposite of Marigold. Mm -hmm. And if it connects with Marigold on some kind of biological level, it's the end of the world. It's Uh doomsday. Yeah. Kind of think about it when you put two magnets together in their opposite ends. Yep. You can't have it happen when it does. You have an explosion of some sort or friction, if you will. Yep. So they're on the mission to go stop them. Meanwhile, you see that number one and Victor and Allison dive into the history of why Ben died because nobody can remember. Yeah, and, and it's and it's a point that gets brought up. I can't remember if it's the episode before this or this one specifically, but like they're like, hey, this is a pretty big event in your lives. The only one who can justify not having any memories because they weren't there was Victor. Mm-hmm. Victor wasn't there, so they're like, obviously, I don't know, but like you guys are there. How do you guys not remember? Yeah, and it's an amazing sequence that she's played out because it's been one of the mysteries of the show, even in the comics, too, Yeah, that they have not touched upon. So we do find out that Ben originally finds Jennifer when they're out on one of their routine missions. They were out on a mission. They were tasked with finding a container, I believe it was, and to bring the container back, and they were given specific instructions to not open the container. Basically, don't do like a Rita Repulse in Power Rangers. Don't, mm-hmm. don't open. Right. So, that, so they go there, and they're in the process of doing that, but... You know, Ben or whoever it was, I can't remember, being the curious kitten. Oh, it's Ben. Yeah, Ben being the curious kitten he is, can't help himself and opens the thing and finds a young Jennifer inside. Yes. So they wind up connecting a little bit. Well, connecting in that she's trapped in this thing. He goes, here, take my hand. I'll help you out. And she grabs his hand. Yeah. And then the effect of their two polar opposite uh, powers or whatever you want to call it start interacting and it starts kicking off. And we do find out that Hargreaves kills them both. Shows up on the spot. Yep. And he was saying, I told you not to connect. I told you I, not I to. Told, I told you to not open the container. Yeah. So in his mission to save the world, he winds up killing both of them and more or less mind wipes everybody from the event. Which, I mean, this has been a trademark it's of on Hargreaves. Par with, it's on par with Hargreaves. Yeah, I mean, it was nothing really new, per se, from what we've already seen of the character. Doesn't mean well, and he's an awful POS. Yeah, and we, like I say, we've all known this since, ever since we started watching the show. In terms of the Father of the Year uh, competition, he is not in the running. Yeah, I mean, Fiora, Fiora does a great job playing yeah. him. Yeah, Because you instantly hate him for what he's doing. But he tries justifying it. He almost like he's trying to become sympathetic, but fails. There's a moment, and I can't remember if it's five or six, but it's with Victor. That You, you know which one I'm talking about. Yep. But th- there's a moment with Hargreaves and Victor and, and the entire family, and I, it's like episode five or six, and I'm sitting there watching this, and like on some level I'm, I should be like, you know, this is kind of an overreaction, but I'm sitting there watching this knowing what I know and having seen, you know, the, the previous three seasons and, and what – Hargreaves is done. I'm like, nah, this is justified. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the one thing about Victor is Victor has probably dealt with the most psychological oh, abuse of yeah. anybody on this show. Yeah. From when we've seen 
their appearance from episode one to now, they have really gone through the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that is saying something compared to the rest of the group because they've all gone through something. Mm -hmm. I mean, number one has been the only one who's been the Cyclops to the twisted professor X. Well, I don't know. Professor X ever necessarily left Cyclops on the moon for a year. Well, close to a couple times. Yeah. But we see that he's the only one that that shows any kind of loyalty. Right. Even though he's been the one that was, I mean, half man, half ape experimented, you know, what such everybody else still wears scars from their time being in the umbrella Academy. Cause he's, it was not exactly the nicest time, especially when they're kids and they're somewhat celebrities and it's, and to go through the, the trauma that they go through. And especially in Victor's case, yeah, like I say, Elliot Page did phenomenal this every, every season. Every season, yeah, Page has done amazing. So this was another season of strong work. So when they wind up finally getting rid of Hargraves and getting down to business, they have to kind of make some choices. And I think this is where everything falls off. Yeah, because, yeah, I agree. Because once we get to the last couple episodes. I feel like episode five mm-hmm. was a complete stall because yeah. the whole point was we focused so much time on Lila, uh-huh. Diego's wife, yep. who is also working undercover to try finding out about the keepers mm-hmm. with five. Who's, who's working with the CIA for the same purpose. Right, because that's where his job was. Yep. And they wind up starting dabbling in time travel they get lost in time for seven years yeah so this had some eerie comparisons to a certain run on amazing spider-man lately yeah Uh, boy boy, you're putting that one yep i was waiting to see pat's reaction Uh, on that one but it's it's eerily familiar i mean it's it's a like it, it did stall the thing but to me just in the storytelling and it felt a little too drawn out it 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 felt a little too long in the tooth Mm -hmm. it was still a wild sequence to see that like in in, that they were basically going through these various uh subway stations because that was like the hub or whatever that like they're traveling to these alt because the the i think was episode three or four we finally saw how the timeline works in this universe and that it's basically a map on a subway yeah think of like new york city london any major city that's got a Subway station. Even if you haven't seen one, Google it, and you'll, you'll see what I mean. But it's, it's so much more complicated than the, your average subway map. And they're basically... I, th- I think the initial plan was for them to go back in time to when Ben and Jennifer were killed. And yep. basically prevent that from happening, and then everything will be all hunky-dory. But, of course, as is often the case with timeline and as complicated and convoluted as this multiverse is, it's not exactly as easy as point A to point B, stop, you know, situation number one, go to situation two, and and you're all hunky-dory. They get lost for seven years. But it was drawn out and and way too long, but just the, the... visual of them traveling from bus tr- uh, train station to train station subway station i'm sorry uh and just like and you'd see on various furniture or walls or something like one year two mm-hmm. years so i'm like holy shit like they're really trying this for seven years at that that's wild yeah especially at that time too like I, I thought that they misfired there and i thought they misfired with klaus yes and it's such a disappointment too because yeah. klaus, klaus has always been the breakout character of the show well because klaus when they get their powers back, Klaus doesn't want them back because he's afraid he's going to relapse and he doesn't want to do that again. And he doesn't like himself when he was, you know, had powers and all the drugs and stuff he was doing because, hey, he's clean and he's seeing himself, you know, from the other side of the window, metaphorically speaking, mm. you know. But it, there comes a point when I want to say it was episode two, episode three, that he gets critically uh, he gets he gets shot when they go to the town in Maine. He get he gets critically wounded and it's give him the powers or give him his powers back or he dies. Mm -hmm. So they obviously being family members, give him his powers back. Allison does. Allison gives him his power back, but then that also puts him back down the road of like, Hey, I'm not in all of a good place. Yeah. So that again, prompts him to get this little side storyline where he's going back and using again. And he's now at the mercy of a drug dealer and winds up getting caught in this weird seance for 
information. And, I mean, like, listen, he's being pimped out. Let's call it what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. But it's also like they spend way too much time on this yeah. because, because we don't get a payout. It, it just it reunites him and Allison like at it, the end. It would have been fine if they had just shown a sequence of like throw him in the thing. Here's what you're going to do for me. And then, like, I was okay with, like, I understood the scene where there was the money. He's like, oh, I'm going to pay this, uh, you know, f- 500 bucks in 30 minutes. I'm going to pay this back real quick. And then the guy's like, all right, here's the cut for the food. Here's the cut for the utilities. Here's the cut for the, this. I, like, I was like, okay, I get that. You're just trying to illustrate he's going to get stuck there. But, like, did we need the whole sequence with the dead husband and, and the ex-wife who just wanted to have sex? Yeah. Like, I spent more time trying to figure out who the actor was playing the dead husband than I did actually paying attention to the thing because uh, he he looked like uh, Michael Keaton. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, did they get Michael Keaton for this show? I'm like, is that, that what fucking look like? It looked like Michael Keaton from a certain angle. Well, it, it definitely did. But like I say, it just it was just too much of just like, why? Yeah, no, Cause, I agree. Because you just, you, like I say, you understand you want to give him a storyline, but there's no payout. No. Like, okay, so he gets back with everybody. Great. Because, yeah, that's the whole thing, like you alluded to. He, he gets his whole thing. He's trapped there. They won't let him out. They're kicking his ass. He finally gets out, and, the, and there's a whole plot line with the dead wife, and she, she, she has sex with Klaus's body, but he's being possessed by the dead husband. Reasons, Re- folks. Reasons. She comes back, oh, I want more, and... and the bot and the and the husband comes back instantly. The second time he's like, "Oh, I knew you couldn't stay away," but we come to find out that the whole p- purpose of this is there's a shit ton of money. I don't think we ever actually find out how much, or if they, we do, I drove it out of my memory. Uh, but there was a shit ton of money. She can't find it. And she wants the money, and the husband won't give it to her. All the meanwhile, the the wife is torturing Klaus's body, trying to get information out of a ghost. But mm. hey, can't do that with a ghost. And then he finally breaks out, so he can get the money, and then he gets buried alive. Yeah, like does it pay off in the overall arc uh, point of the story? It gets him out of the quote unquote jail cell, but it doesn't ultimately mean anything for the end of the show. He doesn't have some like life altering realization. No. He, do- he doesn't come to some you know, mystical conclusion of, of his purpose in life and, and how he should do things differently. And no, no it, it's just a plot device. It's a massive misfire. Yeah. I, th- I think they could have tightened up the season if they just even, like, eliminated this episode, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, the whole point of the series is about focusing on Jennifer, who's played by Victoria Sowell, and Ben and their connection. And as they're now getting romantically linked, they're now having, like, a weird infection going on which ultimately leads them to merging into a monstrous creature in the downtown area yeah. of the city. And the Umbrella Academy has to go deal with them. Meanwhile, they're trying to handle dealing with the Keepers and Gene and Gene Thibodeau, who played by Nick Offerman and Megan Mullally. Uh, just did, like I say, that was a nice comic relief that was going yeah, on there. Yeah. But, like, ultimately, the conflict happens. There's, like, uh, just chaos downtown. Well, yeah, it's like there's conflict. They're at they're at a, some game competition early in the season, and things happen. They end up going to this universe's equivalent of Burger King. I, th- I think, of, what was it called? Reg King? Yeah. Reg King, because Reginald Hargreaves. Uh, you know, they go to the order window, and they, they say some weird phrase about oysters or clams or whatever the hell it was. And come to find out, that's the that's the secret code word to activate the sleeper cell. Mm-hmm. You know, the the girl working the the window at the drive through is like, yes, I understand. And they like throw everybody out of the out of the uh, restaurant, and that's now uh, home base for the keepers. And they're now trying to track down Jennifer. Which at this point, the Umbrella Academy, our heroes, have figured out what the hell is going on, and that they need to find Ben. And they know he's with Jennifer, and, and at this point, Victor is, like, pleading with Reginald, uh, like, hey, let's give him a shot. Let's Because Hargreaves wants to straight up just kill him. He's like, let's just cut out the middleman. Let's cut out the fluff. Let's just kill this guy. Mm-hmm. Victor's Victor's like, no, we, we can't do this. We got to do this the right way. Let's let's try and talk to him. And eventually, the, we they track him down to a hotel he was at, you know, where the two of them... Uh, <laughs> touched so yeah. to, so to speak caused what was it like a six point something earthquake on the richter scale yep and also could they they didn't mention it in the show but i picked it up having watched chernobyl and other movies uh radioactive uh radioactive uh detection was going on there that's that's the device reginald was carrying and it's going the, the popping sound mm-hmm. there's there's radioactive material in the air there so it's really not good 
And in all the meanwhile, they're everyone's looking for Ben. Yeah, which I mean, like I say, it ultimately winds up downtown. There's yeah. a monstrous creature, and because the, they've touched. Yeah, so the academy has to stop them. Yeah, and they find out like the only way they can is if they overdose with the marigold and overload them. But in doing such, they kill themselves. Yeah. So they sacrifice themselves one last time, even though there's no chance. Like. The, the timeline will get reset. There's no guarantee. They're right now mixed up in this whole cleanse, which is all the keepers have been based around. Yeah. And they know there's no guarantee they'll get back to the life they once had. Mm-hmm. So they, but they elect to do this, even though it's a very painful moment going on because we do see a lot of the members saying goodbye to their families. Yeah. And like I say, that you do have that emotional kick in for this. Yeah. So once this all starts happening, they get taken over. It does cause the cataclysmic reset of time. Yeah. And we go basically to a very happy ending with people in a park. Yeah. I mean, the other confusing thing for me was Hargreaves wife. Was that Grace? Yeah. I think that was what it was. All of a sudden, like we find out in the final episode was the like who I thought was going to be like, oh, hey, this is the villain the entire time. They've been operating in the shadows and pulling the strings from behind. No, it's just Grace who all of a sudden has like shape shifting abilities and can like rip people's guts out and take their skin. Yeah. Because reasons, you know, is is basically doing this to reset the timeline and and she didn't want to come back, but he did it out of love and heart felt lovey dovey whatever. I'm like, what the fuck? Like I'm I'm literally watching this the other night going, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. It, like it made no sense. It made it absolutely did not make any sense. So trying to figure it all out, it was very puzzling. Yeah. And like I say, it wraps up very nicely where you do get this fond farewell moments, but it, it, it was almost like too little too late. Like they built it up so much because like you see the guy who ends up recruiting the Umbrella Academy to find Jennifer because he's mm-hmm. got this real vested interest in Jennifer. And then, um, you know, he takes over the body of Nick Offerman's character. Yeah. And he starts exhibiting some red herring or red flag signs to his wife, Jean. Like at one point in the end of an episode, he says, Oh, I hate that song. He starts singing that song. He eats, he's eating mint chocolate chip ice cream. And, and now he's eating this, but like all of a sudden he's going to that. And, and then it's like, Oh, like it felt like it was building to something that like, how did you know this man? Yeah. How did you, why, why do you do this? And I'm like, Oh, this is going to be so like somebody from his past. It's going to be like somebody he wronged. And like, cause Reginald definitely seems like the type that would be like, oh, I stepped on several people's hands and toes to get where I'm at. Mm-hmm. And I figured it was going to be something like that. I'm like, oh, it's going to be like some crazy plot twist of like, oh, it was this person from a previous season or somebody from his past that is like coming back to screw him over. No, it's just his wife for love. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Like I say, they just they had too many moving parts. And yeah. It just really took away from it. Like there's great things to be had about this episode or yeah. series. Yeah. I should say that to wrap it up. But it, it, like overall, I just think that it's a very unsatisfying. ending. Yeah. They just left a lot out there that you're kind of going. I mean, I had a feeling something like I didn't think given the way this show has gone that they were going to get the happy ending. Everyone was going to go their separate ways. Powers or no powers. And they're just going to go live their lives. That that's not been the mo of the show. The show does not do happy endings. You know, <laughs> the world's ended how many times in this series? Oh, it's no. ended. Though they keep screwing up because I mean they're yeah. they're they're so fractured. Yeah, they're not the heroes we need. Yeah, but they're trying to do the heroic things, but they can't get out of their own you know unfortunate traumas mm-hmm. to help. And it's it's it, it's a you know it's a, a tragic superhero story. Yep, to be honest, because they're all trying to be good, but. They just ultimately can't work with each other and can't, you know, get on the same page no matter how close they want to. Yep. But there's still something you you root about them for. And I just feel like that underdog status that we had with them for the past couple seasons just wasn't here. this time. Especially the last two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just feel that like the last two episodes just really took the wind out of the sails because yeah. you're sitting there, you're trying to see the how Luther is finally working together with Diego and the CIA story and that. Fits. Right. And then the Klaus story, it just didn't carry. And then, I mean, Victor had probably the strongest stuff going on. Like, like the whole, you brought up the Luther and Diego in the CIA thing. Like, they spent so much time on that. Yeah, because they were filling. Exactly. They spent so much time on it that you think, oh, this is going to come to play a major part. Like, maybe the final battle is going to be in the CIA. That Like, the CIA is the one behind it the entire time. Yeah. No, it just ends up being like, hey, the CIA, yeah, the, yeah, the CIA is in on it. Like, could have been explained a lot simpler. Oh, absolutely. I think that we had some flashes of brilliance, but ultimately yeah. it, was a, it was a dim bulb. Yeah. 
I mean, to be honest with you, I think that they had some great stuff here. Oh, yeah. I mean, Aiden Gallagher, I think, might have been up there with Elliot Page for, like, the, the break, yes. the standout characters of the season. The confrontation he has with Diego towards, oh, yeah. towards the end of the season, after they come back from, you know, seven years in purgatory or whatever you want to call it. And basically it comes out that, like, yeah, they fell in love. And it's and it's the ramifications and just the, the mic drop argument between the two where he where Diego starts spelling swear words because he does, doesn't want to swear in front of his kids. Except the kids know what he's saying. Like, great scene. But ugh, just couldn't save it. No, definitely couldn't save it at all. So, you know, overall, Pat, I mean, let's we can kind of wrap it up. I mean, what would you grade the series? And what would you grade this season? This The last two seasons definitely hurt my overall grade of the series. Because if you'd have asked me after season two what I would have given the show, I would have told you an easy four out of five. Mm-hmm. Easy four out of five. I could have even been talked into a 4.5 out of five. Now with the last, just because season two was incredible. Season one was great, but season two especially was the best season for me just because of everything going on. I do, As a history buff and a history nerd, I love the time period and I love delving into history and all that. And just, you, you had Allison being a person in the segregated South in night in the 1960s, that storyline was, was just so incredibly written. And I, and I loved it, you know, to go from that to like, Hey, we're just wandering around an endless hotel for however many episodes season three was. Yeah. And that just, then just the all over the map of this season, it, it, the last two seasons definitely knocked it down. But if I had to give it a grade out of five, 2.7, Okay, 2.7, 2.5, somewhere in there. It like it's good. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but like I I'm th- I'm contemplating at some point just because I'm watching a lot of things at this point. I'm contemplating at some point going back and watching the whole series start to finish because as is the case with Netflix, Amazon, Disney, whoever, HBO, whoever you want to look at, it's very starting start and stop and it's hard to like keep up with the pace and keep up with the feel from one season to cuz just cuz there's such a like the last season came out like 2022 mm-hmm. I think is what so there's such a long gap I'm contemplating at some point going back and watching the whole series start to finish and like not one setting but sequential rapid succession we'll see if I still feel the same afterwards but for right now I'm not exactly chomping at the bit to go rewatch it yeah I have to agree I mean I look at it from two sides okay. the, the comic fan because I've read the comic sure and I I really got to go finish Hotel Oblivion out now because, like I say, it's been a while. Yeah. And, like, I'm, I'm blanking on a few key points. But I, I read a lot of comics, folks, if you yeah. haven't realized. Yeah. So that being said, I have to kind of do a deep dive about it because I will say the show did a very good adaptation from the original two volumes. Albeit I even like number the season two mm-hmm. better than I do the actual comic okay. of Dallas. However, though, it's like season three and season four just kind of seem to start slipping further yeah, away yeah. and losing my interest. And maybe that's kind of you know retrospective about where I was kind of going with Hotel Oblivion. So seeing where things lie now, yeah. I would say if I have to do a, a grade for the overall s- series, I'm, I'm going to say it's probably about a 3-5. Okay. Because I think the, the, seeing this show get on air is a feat. Sure. Seeing it go four seasons, it has to be applauded, especially sure. in this day and age sure. where a lot of shows don't get that from comics. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. Still not over Deadly Class getting canceled by sci fi. Still not over that. But this season overall, though, I have to give it like a, a 2.2. 2. I'm going, yeah. See, for me, the overall series, 2.7, 2.5. So this season, two. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just there was too many areas where it just wasn't clicking. Like, and even, you know, a little peek behind the curtain, I watched the first three episodes. It came out, what, Friday? Mm-hmm. I watched the first three episodes between Friday and Saturday night, so the 9th and 10th. And I was still sitting with the final three episodes, and I wasn't rushing to go watch the final three episodes. You know, it was it was the fact that, like, I knew we were going to be talking about it this week that I was like, OK, I have to finish this. But were it not for the fact that we were going to be recording this and, and talking about it on this, I don't know if I would have finished. I, I would have finished it at some point. I'm not saying right. I'm not saying I would have gone like final season of House of Cards and just not finished it. But, you know, I, I I'm not sure at this present time in an alternate timeline, I would have finished it yet. 
Yeah. I think it's one of the situations, too, where it was short. It really sped through. Rushed there, in, in production. It felt like there was a little bit too much filler for my liking, even, yeah. though, even though we had great performances from Elliot Page and Aiden Gallagher, too. Standout performances. By the way, I'm already going to put out in the karma. Aiden Gallagher needs to be Damian Wayne. I've seen this online, and I can't uh, escape that thought. I, I can see it. I can't escape that. I can see it. But I think for overall, it was a serviceable ending. But, it was all, yeah, it was but, all right. But not when I'm clamoring to go back and watch right away. It's it's not final season Game of Thrones bad. No, no, but definitely it, not that bad. It's not bad, but it, it could have been a lot better. Well, when the bar is set high, and, yeah, and, and, yeah, and you don't yeah. hit the, and you don't hit the mark, it falls short. But that being said, we gave you our grade and, and opinions of season four of Netflix and Dark Horse Comics, Umbrella Academy. Now we want to hear yours. Hit us up on the hashtag hashtag Odie Page Pod. What is your thoughts on the series and season of The Umbrella Academy? Let's talk about it, shall we? But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. The content you are listening to is part of the Nerd Initiative Podcast Network. For more info about the home of pop culture positivity, check out nerdinitiative.com. You ever wondered what comics Mark from Vale Mai is into? What Zach from Left Behind's favorite MCU movies are? Well, Metalcore Nerds is the show for you. My name is Sean Mott, and here at Metalcore Nerds, we cover the latest things in pop culture, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, DC, AEW, and everything else in between. You can listen to the show every Monday on Adobe Howl at 7 p.m. Eastern or find it anywhere you find podcasts after it debuts on the radio station. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And there was another big event that happened recently that we have to recap. Yeah. And this is one up there with San Diego Comic-Con, New York yeah. Comic-Con. Yeah. But primarily focusing on the House of the Mouse Pad, what are we talking about? We're going to be talking about D23. So if anybody's not familiar with that, what is D23? D23 is the convention expo for all things Disney. You like Marvel? Well, they'll have stuff for Marvel. You like Star Wars? They will have stuff for Star Wars. If you are a fan of the parks, they have stuff for you. If you like the cruises, they might have stuff for you. They don't announce stuff for them every year, but this year they did. You know, if you like collector stuff, they certainly got stuff for that. If you want to preview what's coming to the shops at the theme parks over the next couple of years, I got that too. Video games? Sure. Uh, but yeah, if you're a thing of anything Disney related or Disney owned, uh, this is the place to be. Yeah, so there was a lot going on, and especially, too, with so much coming out of San Diego Comic-Con, we were all waiting to hear what was going to be coming out involving the MCU, Star mm -hmm, Wars, mm -hmm. and we did get our answers, so we're going to have to recap what stood out to us. So, Pad, yeah. what was jumping out to you from this? A couple things that they talked about, They, you know, specifically with the panel that took place uh, Saturday night, because that was the big one. That was the one everyone was, was there for. Uh, saw the photos in the videos. There's a lot of people in that auditorium or whatever the hell that room was. Good Lord. Uh, a couple things that did stand out. Uh, Dwayne Johnson is obviously was there talking about what's going on with Moana, too. No, there's a lot of fans of that. Uh, that was definitely interesting. But he did announce that uh, he's working on a new uh, project with Alan Bergman, uh, who they've apparently been working together for a while. Uh, it is a t movie called, titled uh, Monster Jam. That's according to an article from comicbook.com. Uh, quote, it will be a live action cinematic experience from the point of view of the monster trucks. Hmm. It says Berg uh, Bergen hypes the larger Disney portfolio. He talks about Avatar initially being the one that got away from Disney and how happy he is to have it back in the portfolio. Uh, but that, Dwayne Johnson, Disney, uh, talking monster trucks. I mean, listen, you you got the kids sold. They're rolling in cash. They absolutely are. That, that'll be a monster hit, pun intended. Mm -hmm. uh, then they talked a little bit about Avatar 3, which is admittedly, I'm not the biggest Avatar fan. It does still interest me in some, some capacity. Just the level and the depth at which, at which James Cameron goes for this movie. I, I, I don't get it. I'm sorry. Like, I, I tried dipping into Avatar 2. I, have, I still haven't seen it. I, I tried, man. I just I, I saw the first one. Like, listen, if that's your jam, my, more power to you. Yeah. Just meet no. Saw the first one. Visually, it was impressive as all hell. The story mm -hmm. was nothing really to write home about. I haven't gotten around to seeing the second one. Nothing against the second one. Just, hey, I'm a busy dude. I'm getting married this year. Uh, but he did talk about that, and we did get an official title uh, for the upcoming film, which is titled Avatar Fire and, Fire and Ash. So... Boy, they're really liking to copy the whole Avatar The Last Airbender uh, mm. method <laughs> methodology there. Mm. Uh, mm, mm, mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, another thing that stood out to me, though, that I, good Lord, did not see this coming at all, is that uh, the folks over at Pixar announced one of their new projects, Incredibles 3. Yeah. Holy hell. Did not expect this. I mean, it's been long rumored. Obviously, 
the Pixar's first family of animation mm-hmm. made a big splash with its first one. The sequel is there. Did not expect them to go for a trilogy. I mean, it's, yeah. it's been long rumored, but we it's kind of quieted down to the point I thought it just kind of went away. Well, it took them 14 years to make a sequel. Incredib- yeah. uh, Incredibles 1, of course, came out in 2004. Uh, second one, 14 years later, 2018. I had not heard anything, admittedly. Again, I haven't gotten around to seeing Incredibles 2. I'll get there at some point. Uh, but I, I just had not heard anything of like, yeah, they're they're quietly planning an Incredibles 3. But hey, more power to him because Brad Bird is coming back to direct the uh, third one. So hey, that should be something real good because uh, you cannot go wrong with that. No, definitely not. I mean, it's the best Fantastic Four movie not named Fantastic Four. Facts. Uh, they did talk a little bit about Toy Story 5, which... Why? I, what, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. At this stage, why? Three was the absolute perfect ending. As somebody who grew up on the first two, saw the first one as a kid at home, you know, when my parents brought the VHS home, saw the second one in theaters, and then I saw the third one on a date with, with somebody I was dating at the time, not my current fiance, somebody else. Three was the absolute perfect ending to a story I have ever seen, ever. You know, it, it's... Top five might be top three endings to a trilogy ever. And and four came out and I was and I was skeptical of it. And I went, eh, you know what? As I've often said on this show, let me give it its chance. Let me give it its due before I really s- sit here and go, why? Mm-hmm. And, and it came out. And, and while I will admit it's an OK movie, it's not necessarily required viewing to me. I explained it to somebody at the time and I still hold true to this. It's kind of like an epilogue at the end of a book. It's not really required reading, but it's there if you want it. Right. You know, but so the fact that they're doing a fifth one, although admittedly it sounds like it's going to be toys versus technology, which, boy, if that ain't on the nose these days. Uh, but no, it, it's kind of going to be, it, it's interesting just because Woody left the group, spoiler alert, at the end of four to strike out with Bo Peep. But now, at least according to the images we've seen that were released from this, he's back with the toys now. So eh, reasons, who knows? It's all about family. They they want to rival the Fast and Furious. It's gonna be all about family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just I'm I'm sorry. Like I think it, it's ran its course in my opinion. Oh, I agree. You know, no, I, I understand agree. why it's a popular franchise, yeah. but yeah, eventually you have to say when. In my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the other one that uh, they, that Disney did talk about was the upcoming Frozen three. Although they did say, and I did see the one quote that for based off what they did and what they kind of introduced with two, they might need two sequels to finish this out. So parents get ready for Frozen Four coming soon. They haven't announced it yet, but yeah, you got to figure. Just make it a two parter. It's fine. Yeah, it should be. It should be fine. Then we get to Star Wars, baby. Uh, Jude Law did come on stage. We showed off. They showed off the first trailer for Skeleton Crew. Holy hell, this looks good. And it looks like something out of the eighties. Yeah. This, oh my god. This looked like something very different. I know there was a lot of online. Uh, flack, if you will, mm-hmm. and we, like I guess I was trying to decipher why because it was what kids reasons. Were, yeah, kids were based in it, probably. Like because it was because what's the whole story about? Uh, it's it's about basically four young kids who are accidentally lost in space and they need to find their way home. Yeah, I mean it sounds like an alternate plot just in space of the Goonies. Mm-hmm. Like it, it sounds like one of those. It's if you've seen a coming of age movie from the eighties. You know, because this is definitely inspired by those Amblin coming of age, you know, Steven Spielberg movies. Yeah. You know, it looks awesome. It looks fun. It's coming out around December, which is like prime family time. So, like, if you want to get together with your family and watch something fun, that ain't necessarily decapitating heads or asking super deep questions that are going to rock kids philosophically. This this is going to be your gem. Yeah. Like I say, I thought this looked great. Yeah. I I was very happy with it. I mean, I don't know what to expect, Mm -hmm. but. Live action Star Wars, yeah. Majority of the time is a bullseye. I mean, even yeah. even their less than stellar stuff has been entertaining at some point. Yeah. So, and plus, I also live by the fact if I don't like something, I just don't watch it and don't complain about it. This is very true. Uh, then they also talked about uh, Diego Luna came out to talk about Andor season two. Uh, we did find out that the off. Uh, I think it's only going to be two seasons. Um, yes. The next upcoming season is going to be take uh, pl- across the span of uh, four years. So, boy, we're, we're time jumping a lot. Uh, we also, uh, f- of course, as was alluded to, uh, I don't know why people were surprised by this. They said he wasn't going to be coming until season two. Uh, we do know K2SO, uh, oh, okay. played by Alan Tudyk, is going to be in this season. Also, uh, as revealed in the footage that was shown at D23, uh, reprising his role. As director Krennic 
Ben Mendelsohn. Yes. And also returning, reprising his role for the, God, this has got to be the fourth time I think he's played this character. Saw Gerrera, Forrest Whitaker. Which, again, makes sense. Yeah, complete, completely makes sense. The only thing I hope is they learn from the mistake of season one mm-hmm. and jump right into the story. Yes. We don't need to take the scenic route to get where we're going. We, not, know, we know how this all ends. Yeah, not, not every show on TV needs to be a slow burn. Exactly, Please. especially in this scenario. Yeah. It, it does not need to be. Yeah. Uh, then John Favreau and Dave Filoni, the goats of Star Wars right now, <coughs> excuse me, came on, uh, came on stage. He talked a little about Mandalorian and Grogu. Uh, you know, so uh, it was reviewed. They did show a little bit of footage from uh, the filming. They've started filming. Not a whole lot has been filmed. Uh, we did find out that the Razor Crest is going to be making a comeback. So, hey, more power to that. Mm. Uh, Zeb from uh, Rebels is going to be hey. ma- making a return. Uh, we did see Grogu running away from ATATs. So how the hell they get into that? <laughs> don't know but it looks like it's going to be amazing and cannot be soon enough and as we should note going to be the first time star wars is back in theaters uh when this releases i think it's coming 2026 it could be yes great. uh it's gonna be the first time star wars is back in theaters since rise of skywalker oh it's it's gonna shut down pop culture absolutely i think for anybody that's underestimating the power of the show uh-huh It still generates volumes, and the fact that we're getting an actual full-fledged feature film, Uh I'm saying that three times fast, it's a big deal. So I would expect a lot of problems trying to buy tickets for that. That's going to be the hottest ticket in town. Yeah. Uh, Then we got to the Marvel portion. Let's go. Marvel portion of things. They did talk a little bit about Captain America Brave New World. Uh, Not really holding a lot of new of this. Just a little bit of new footage. A lot of it was the same stuff from San Diego Comic-Con. So if you saw that footage, you know, you've kind of seen what you needed to see. Uh, The thing we did get, though, was right after that was a video from the cast of the upcoming Fantastic Four movie. Because remember what we said a couple weeks ago. Uh, the film was going to start filming the Tuesday after San Diego Comic-Con ended. And we got a video from the cast at the set talking about that. We also got our first look at the uh, Fantastic Four costume that is going to be t- uh, in the film. And I got to say, costume, a little different, but it's growing on me. You know, the thing about it we have to remember is I mean, the early Fantastic Four costume is very simplistic. Yeah. And then when they started getting into, I want to say the 70s to 80s, 80s mm-hmm. by the latest, that's when you saw the blue and white scheme appear. Yeah. And that's what they're borrowing from. So the one thing that we really just have to keep in mind with this film is they're going to borrow from a lot of different eras of the Fantastic Four uh-huh. to give us something different. I don't mind the costume. And plus one thing, too, is it's still footage. It's yeah. not done with CGI just yet. Yeah. So unstable uh, molecules will be playing a big factor in this. I'm just going to put it out there. Uh-huh. Uh, then we did get a little bit of an update on the show that I think some people might have forgotten is coming, and that is the Ironheart miniseries. Yeah. Yeah, which, of course, uh, filmed shot like two years ago, which the fact that we still waiting on the show is kind of interesting. Uh, but there was a little bit of, uh, of footage shown, you know, in which uh, reading from a description on comicbook.com uh, says, quote, the hood enlists Riri to uh, in, a, in illegal jobs to get money to make her suit. So I'm not quite sure where this is going to go, but Hey, the fact that they're acknowledging it exists. Good for them. Well, we had to remember when Bob Iger came back, there was a lot of questions about certain shows, what was coming back, the restructuring of the MCU as a whole. Uh-huh. And Ironheart was in one of those kind of stack quotes that we didn't know. Uh-huh. We knew stuff had been filmed, but that doesn't mean necessarily it's going to hit the light of day, uh-huh. i.e. very different scenario, Batgirl and WBD. Yeah. So in this situation, I'm, I'm excited we're going to see this. I think Ironheart against the hood is something I did not have lined up. Mm-hmm. But I, the hood is can be a very, very interesting villain. Yeah, uh, one of the better ones in Marvels in recent years, in my opinion. Yeah, so I'm excited about this. I don't know anything about Mephisto. I don't care. But like, listen, just let me see the show and let's go. Yeah. Uh, then we got a little bit of an update and some new info from the Daredevil Born Again yes. series. Yes. Uh, officially confirmed, yes. jo- John Bernthal is back as Frank Castle. Let's go. Also found out season two coming. Damn thing ain't even out yet. We're getting season two. Oh, it, there's no question about this. I think if anything we can say is a lock and leap, we're going to borrow from the sports show. Okay. 
The lock is this is going to be the franchise of Marvel live action on Disney Plus. Oh sure, there's no question. The bar was set too high at Netflix for them not to come in uh, and listen. Whoever the powers be that decided to restructure the whole thing, kudos to you. Uh huh. Because they understand the temp in the room. Uh huh. The temp in the room is we want that show. Yes. And now there's a window for it. I know they announced the villain or a villain that's going to be featured in it. And it's Muse. Who is from the Charles Soule and Ron Garney run? Yeah. So yeah. um that's wild that we're also getting White Tiger. Yes, that's that's crazy too. I mean, that's the fact they're expanding on the the Hell's Kitchen uh dynamic, I mm-hmm. love. And mm-hmm. and the fact that we have Burnthal back, which let's face it, Frank Castle at Marvel right now is mm. is off the grid. We have a great new Punisher that was written by our friend David Pepos. Uh, who's now starting to get a little higher profile in the comics. So the fact we're still going to have Frank, I love because Bernthal does an amazing job with him. Yep. And the fact that they kept the core group together, Foggy, Karen, yeah. and obviously Kingpin. Yeah, oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. you need Vincent D'Onofrio back. Uh-huh. It was Charlie Cox and, mm-hmm. like, just let him do magic on screen. Like, this is all but win. I'm, I'm – like oh, take, yeah. take my money now. Ka- well, we know Kamala Khan's dad is going to be making a, an appearance yeah. in this show. Bullseye is back. Holy hell! Yeah. Well, y- y- you have to. I, yeah. I think if you're if you're going to do Daredevil properly, you need certain villains. Dare- Bullseye has to be mm-hmm. in there. Kingman mm-hmm. has to be in there. You can stretch the owl. Yeah. Um. You could even stretch Stilt Man. Uh, but uh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. But I. Th- but I love the fact they're doing deep dives, especially with Muse. Yeah. Muse is a very different rogue yeah. in the sense of like yeah. setup and principle. So I love the fact they're going with this. Uh, then they talked a little bit about Agatha all along because, Hey, that's coming out real short here. September, uh, September. Uh, we did see They did put out a new trailer for that. A little bit of footage, uh, you know, uh, she, uh, Agatha getting her, her coven together. Obviously it's, it's Agatha Harkness. Uh, it's Catherine, uh, Catherine Hahn. It's gonna be a lot of singing, singing involved. Uh, you know, they show off uh, the Witches Road with, with a whole bunch of stuff going on. You know, homages to the Wizard of Oz and seventies and eighties team movies. Uh, you know, the the cast did get on stage and sing the song from the trailer. Uh, and and the Lopez's uh, got a shout out for writing their songs, and the writers of the songs came out on stage. So a little bit of a fun to end the whole Marvel portion of things. Yeah, I mean, we have to. I mean, Catherine Hahn's going to crush it. I mean, the fact that we actually have an Agatha show. Yeah, which. I honestly didn't believe until I saw the trailer. Yeah. I think that speaks volumes for the character and the popularity. Mm-hmm. Where, where we're ultimately going with it, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I would imagine maybe, and this is, like I say, we'll do this Locks and Leap style. This is a leap. I think this might be the slow burn introduction for the Midnight Suns. Could be. So we'll have to kind of wait and see how everything shapes up there. But with Agatha obviously tied in with one Wanda Maximoff, uh-huh. you never know what this is going to might bring in the Scarlet Witch back. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things up in the air, but I just I like the fact they're trying to keep the show alive yeah. and do something different with it. So yeah, uh, then a couple other things that jumped out to me: uh, they did officially announce that season two of the Percy Jackson show, which I still got to see season one. I haven't gotten around to it. I've heard good things. I have, I, I'm yeah. with you too. Yeah, uh, they did say that uh, season two is. Uh, Officially titled or going to be titled Sea of Monsters, uh, and they did announce they're only a week into production. So didn't show a whole lot of what's going on. But hey, when you're a week into production, don't expect a whole lot. Uh, they did show off a show that, admittedly, I'm kind of interested in. David Blaine, do not attempt. Uh, and it's, of course, David Blaine. It's going to be magic tricks. If you don't know why I'm interested in, in this, go watch the clip from when David Blaine does the card trick with the orange and Harrison Ford. Yeah. Look up, look up David Blaine Harrison Ford. You'll see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, quote, get the fuck out. Yeah. Uh, then the one I. I heard rumored, but I wasn't until I wasn't going to believe it until they announced it. They're doing Freaky Friday too with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan, called Freakier Freakier Friday, which why? But eh, okay, I I I mark it up there with Toy Story Five. Yeah, why? Yeah, at this stage, why? Yeah, uh, and then the last one that, that, that kind of jumped out at me that I I was once they announced it, I, I was skeptical, but then I saw the footage and I was like, you know what? It doesn't look that bad. Uh, the live action Lilo and Stitch movie. Now, I I grew up on the Lilo and Stitch movie. Yeah, I was gonna say that's your property right there. Was one of my favorite movies when I was growing up. You know, saw it in theaters when it came out. Owned it on, I think at that point DVD. Uh, saw it a whole bunch of times. You know, growing up on Saturday mornings or Saturday nights when I got nothing else going on. When they announced, it, I was like, okay. You really got to do this justice because it's one of the most beloved movies for an entire generation. They didn't show 
footage from the movie, they did show what Stitch is going to look like. And that, to me, is like the key part of the movie. You know, if you're doing a live adaptation of, I'm trying to think of a random uh, movie, like Five Goes West, okay. you know, or Land Before Time. If you're going to do a live action adaptation of that, they better look real goddamn close to how they looked in the original source material case in point sonic remember yeah. what remember what sonic looked like the first go around in the first trailer yeah and everyone's reaction It'd be a similar thing stitch actually looks pretty goddamn good for the for the footage they showed off so at least with that i'm comforted they're they're they've got to have a real tough time casting some of the characters though just because you gotta you gotta nail those you know this can't be a this can't be a borderland situation where hey we're going to get some of the biggest named Hollywood actors and rely on name power alone to get people to go see a movie. You want to see how how that works? Look at the box office numbers for Borderlands. Enough said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have to agree with you on that, Pat. I mean, I know, like I said, Lilo and Stitch. That that's your yeah. your baby right there. Yeah. That's your property. Like you've been a fan of that for I don't oh, know yeah. how many years now. A long time. So like I say, but it's always a it's a risk of gamble doing yeah. doing live action from animation. Yeah. So it's uh, we'll have to wait and see. Like I say, from what I saw of it, it looked good though. Yeah. And then lastly, certainly not leastly, Tron Aries. Yeah. Coming from the folks at Disney with Jared Leto uh in is in the film. But uh remind me one more time, who's doing the music for uh Tron Aries? Nine inch nails. They're reuniting for the movie. Like, listen, that's this, is, this isn't Trent Reznor doing film composition, which, hey, if you aren't aware, he does yeah. fairly regularly these days. No, the band is getting back together to write new music for this movie. Yeah, I'm in. I like his, <laughs> I, I, I had no care about this movie, honestly, before I heard that. And then I'm like, uh, the band's back together. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm going. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Like, that's the only reason why. Or maybe I'll just buy the soundtrack. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so that was kind of the, some of the big points for the main Saturday thing. Any, what were your, what was your favorite parts? I mean, my favorite is Daredevil. Uh huh. They, I, it's been in such rumorville. Yeah. To, to put it mildly, about like what we're gonna get, and the fact that we got confirmation about Bernthal being back, which that was one that I've been waiting to hear about. Been rumored for a while. Yeah, because you just don't know. I mean, obviously with the Frank Castle being eliminated from Marvel right now, uh-huh. he, he's I forget where he is after the Jason Aaron story. Mm-hmm. But we do have a new one. I was waiting to see, okay, we're going to have Joe Garrison or are we going to keep Frank? Uh-huh. Uh, I love we're keeping Frank because Bernthal, I mean, he does him phenomenally. And the the fact that I actually saw Karen and Foggy were back. Right. Like, okay, this this feels like Daredevil. So that really blew me away. Uh, Skeleton crew, I thought looked good for, yeah. for what it was. Like, because the only thing I knew is Jude Law was connected to it. That's yeah. the only thing I knew, and and I feel better about it. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to be more excited to see it. I still think that the ones that find Ahsoka. Yeah, that that well, that's that's one. Well, we we know Ahsoka's coming, but obviously, given the um, untimely passing of. Uh, uh, Ray Stevenson. Ray Stevenson. That's obviously going to be a whole thing that they got to figure out and do. So they're they're going to take their time on that. Plus, Dave Filoni and crew are tied up a whole lot with the whole Mandalorian and Grogu thing. So it might come after Mandalorian and Grogu. Um, interestingly, though, no mention. Of, I know a lot of people are figuring uh, Acolyte would get something. No mention of Acolyte season two. So well, eh, we'll see. I I think it's. They had too much loaded on the deck. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think this was a situation where. Disney had to win back the crowd. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes when you have to win back the audience, mm-hmm. you unload the arsenal. Mm-hmm. This wasn't the case. Yeah. And I think with Mandalorian, or I mean, I'm sorry, Acolyte, you're dealing with High Republic. Yeah. So. Yeah. They got a lot going on. There's, It's not just as simple as like writing the show. There's the books and the, and, and I'm talking like all levels, child, young adult, yeah. and adult on top of the comics, there's on top of lot. audio dramas. Like there's a lot tying together with all that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So like I say, I wasn't super shocked by that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think maybe, strictly maybe, New York Comic Con. Could be. So could be. Yeah, because I think I can imagine there'll be at least one Star Wars panel there and something like it. Oh, there'll be the usual uh, galaxy far, far away. Yeah. yeah, The book one. But yeah, we'll see. Uh, Then on, I believe it was Sunday, there was a Marvel animation panel. Uh, was hosted by somebody we're at least familiar with, uh, Brandon Davis. Yeah. Shout out to Brandon. Brandon's got to come on the show sometime. He does. Just putting that out there. Uh, but they talked about a bunch of the stuff from the Marvel animation side of things. Unfortunately, none of the footage was posted online, so we're just kind of going off descript- descriptions. Uh, but we did find out that, of course, the third and uh, upcoming third season of What If is going to be the final season. Uh, of course, it's a kind of different alternate universe takes on what we saw from the movies. Uh, but we did get we did find out 
from reports online that the final season of the show is going to have a Voltron anime style episode in, uh, with an introduction as an Avengers team led by Sam Wilson consisting of Moon Knight, Photon, Red Guardian. Uh, and, and they're going to be pil- piloting, because of course, Voltron style, giant mech suits in order to combat gamma monsters. I'm you, in. You, you have my money. Take, yeah. it, take it now. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing about what if I think people were getting mad about mm-hmm. it getting canceled. The thing about what if is what if can come back at any point. Right, and they've pretty much already essentially caught up to all the movies. Yeah, so, so. And, and especially it's based around the movies. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's not like the comic where it, it comes and goes in yeah. in print form. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not super upset about it, but I think they're going to do some great work. Uh, we did, of course, also find out that uh, some characters such as Moon Knight, Ironheart, Shang-Chi, and White Vision are going to be seen in the final season and all played by or voiced by their actors from the films. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because uh, like I say. Oscar Mo- Isaac's coming back as Moon Knight. Yeah, that's the one that really caught me off guard. Which Hell is, yeah, Because we've not heard anything about Moon Knight. Uh-huh. Uh, we did get some interesting information and footage, although, again, going off descriptions, not actual video, for X-Men 97 Season 2. Yes. It was revealed in, in the brief footage that was shown, Grant Morrison suits. Let me correct you on this. Okay. It's Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely. Okay. Because I know Quitely designed the suits. They were in Grant's run. Ah, So we, okay. we want to give that credit there. Okay. Uh, but they will be wearing those suits in the upcoming season, uh, and there will be characters such as Havoc, Polaris, Bishop, Apocalypse, and Danger in the upcoming season. So, initial thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're going to be copying some of Grant Morrison's writing for uh-huh. this, because uh-huh. uh, especially if they're going to be using the Frank Quitely suits, um, we're going to go into some really strange places. Mm-hmm. I do like the addition of Havoc and Polaris. Mm-hmm. Danger is a little... Uh, danger, could, to me, screams a filler episode, though. Could be. Just because of, of how it plays out. Could be. But, like, what, what can you say? They haven't done any wrong on season one, so season yeah. two, the bar is set super high. Yeah. We also did find out uh, from some brief snippets that, of course, surprised no one, uh, Wolverine survived. But, yeah, kind of figured that. Yeah, we all knew that. Kind of figured that. Uh, then we got a little bit of information and a tease about a show I did not know was coming. But, hey, I'm, I'm super interested. Eyes of Wakanda. Oh, my God. I forgot about that show. I did not know this was a thing. Uh, so I'm reading from an article on DiscussingFilm.net. It says, quote, uh, the series would be exploring new corners of the Marvel Universe, more specifically the mystical city of... Kunlun, and the culture of that society would be explored, along with a new version of the character of Iron Fist would appear in the series, given that he is known as the defender of Kunlun in the comics. Uh, Ryan Coogler was at the presentation and spoke about the direction of the series and how war dogs are challenged with keeping Wakanda secret, so we can go back and look at that at the sacrifice people made to keep that secret, close quote. We did find out about a new series, though, uh, a new character in the series, uh, quote, uh, uh, title named Nani, uh, N O N I. Uh, he's going to be, I guess, a disruptor in Wakanda. He's going to be uh, basically like, hey, you think this, this city's the bright future that the world hopes for and, and can be the bright, shining beacon that everyone aspires to? Not so fast, my friends. There's corruption and there's a lot of uh, evil stuff going on on the underbelly of the city, and I'm going to expose it. You know, I remember hearing that they were going to be doing a show, an animated show in Wakanda. Uh huh. I just, that, I mean, God, how many years ago was that? A while ago. I want to say it was after the first film. Uh huh. Could be. Holy smokes. Could be. I mean, it does sound cool. I mean, especially. Yeah. It's interesting they're tying Iron Fist in there. Yeah. Well, it's going to be Iron Fist 50th anniversary, so that makes yeah, some sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Uh, then we got a uh, bit of an in- information update on the upcoming Your Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man series. Ooh, I want to hear about, yeah, th- th- I want to hear more about this. Uh-huh. Uh, so, again, reading from the article on DiscussingFilm.net, it does say uh, the upcoming Friendly Neighborhoods, quote, the nef- upcoming Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man series was introduced at the Marvel Animation D23 panel as being about a Spider-Man that you know, but maybe not the one you expect. Teasing a story that diverts from the one fans saw in the MCU trilogy of movies. Uh, That difference was expounded upon at the panel with the key difference between Peter Parker in this series and the one in the MCU being Peter's mentor. Whereas he learned from Tony Stark and all of his mistakes and morals in the movies, it's Norman Osborn Hmm. who mentors Peter in the show. And Osborn uses methods that some people find questionable. Uh, with this news came the casting of Coleman Domingo. Let's go. As Norman Osborn. Holy 
hell. My money is there. Uh huh. I'm sorry, you got the the legend mm-hmm. from Fear of the Walking Fear of the Walking Dead to come on. Uh huh. You got you got mm-hmm. Strand. I'm mm-hmm. I'm good. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting stuff with that. Super excited for that. Then we got the update on the one I know a lot of people are excited for. The one that was announced a while ago. Uh, and that is Marvel Zombies. Ooh, okay. It's going to be a hardcore TV MA series, so uh, not for kids. Uh, and it's going to be a four-episode event. So we did, say, we did see, according to some descriptions from the footage that was shown, uh, Shang-Chi, Katie, Jimmy Wu are, are going to be in there. Uh, obviously, it's going to deal with a lot of zombies. Uh I guess some of the descriptions online have kind of a, a akin to the fighting style and kind of the animation style that's going on to like an attack on Titan. Okay. Kind of thing. So that's, that's cool. Though. You know, the, the, there's like a kaiju like zombie. I guess they fight, you know, Mandarin, Mandarin shows up. Uh, Mandarin, I guess, ends up transferring the rings, the 10 rings to Shang-Chi. So, yo, let's go some places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be a good idea. Could be a horrible idea. Uh, well, let's roll some dice. That's the way, uh-huh, that's the way I treat uh-huh. that one. Scrolls are show up at one point. You know, it looks like something out of Mad Max, I guess. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to admit, anytime you kind of dabble in this area in, in the MCU, I'm, I'm always uh, a touch skeptical. Yeah, but it sounds interesting. And, and I know it's one that fan because they announced this God like four years ago. Oh, yeah. It and was, there's been like literally nothing about it up until now. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean... There's, there's going to be a lot of things. I think they're coming yeah. back with a little bit of vengeance yeah. for the animation yeah. stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, when you have X-Men 97 that sets oh. such a high bar, I mean, yeah. you're going to have a lot of eyes on it. Yeah. I mean, final thoughts on D23? Super excited. I, I dug the animation stuff just because animation is such a ball of wind right now, especially for a lot of years. You know, the, the I guess, king of animation, if you want to talk comic stuff, was uh, DC, and understandably so. I mean, yeah. You, you look at Batman animated series, Superman animated series, Justice League bunch of the animated films, even Batman Brave and the Bold and some of the other stuff they've done, you know, over the years, you know, just don't get me wrong. X-Men, the original animated series, incredible. Spider-Man, the animated series in the 90s, incredible. But then it kind of falls off a cliff a little bit. Don't get me wrong. There's there's some yeah, little, little good stuff. You know, X-Men Evolution was, was not bad for its time. You know, I know Wolverine and the X-Men was, was good for its time, but it just didn't come anything close to what DC was putting out. And it, and it finally seems like Marvel and the powers that be are realizing like, Hey, there's a market and there's an opportunity for these great animated stories. And we need to invest in that. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, like I said, this is just a big bucket of win for everybody. Yeah. A lot of fandoms can really go celebrate and we definitely want to have those interactions. So let's talk about it. Shall we? Sadly, no kingdom hearts news. Yeah. But to anybody who was expecting Kingdom Hearts news at D23, boy, you're inexperienced. I think it's just you and Tyler from 30 and Nerdy that are, are expecting that every time. I Listen, I wasn't expecting it. No, no, but I think... I, I, I've been around the block enough times waiting for Kingdom Hearts news to know it's not coming at D23. I'm just waiting for you two to have a show about that. Yeah, someday. 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 In the meantime, though, his up in the hashtag. Hashtag ODPHPod. D23 has come and gone for 2024. What's your thoughts? What are you excited to talk about? Let's have that conversation, shall we? But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Scott Snyder, and you better listen to the ODPH podcast, or I'm coming for you, and Batman is coming for you. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about. The first of which is some unfortunate news, uh, but it was announced uh, on Monday via social the social media account of Veronica Taylor uh, that the voice actress Rachel Lillis, who voiced the English language uh, role of Misty and Jesse on the Pokemon anime uh, and movie adaptations, uh, had has passed away at the age of 46. Uh, of course, Veronica Taylor voiced Ash on the Pokemon series for a whole long time. Uh, probably, I want to say at least 10 plus years. It, wow. it was it was a while. Uh, but she did say, quote, it is with a very heavy heart that I share the news of the passing of Rachel Lillis on Saturday evening, uh, August 10th, 2024. Rachel was an extraordinary talent, a bright light that shone through her voice, whether speaking or singing. She will be forever remembered for the many ad- animated roles she played with her iconic performances as Pokemon's Misty and Jesse being the most beloved, t- close quote, Taylor said in her post. Uh, she went on to say, quote, Rachel was so thankful for all the generous love and support that was given to her as she battled cancer. It truly made a positive difference. Her family also wishes to thank you as they take this time to grieve privately. A memorial is being planned for a future date, close quote. Uh, 
on Monday as well. Uh, Lillis's sister, Lori Orr, uh, was an organizer of a GoFundMe page to I got to uh, help offset some of the recent medical care costs. Uh, also announced the uh, actress's death over the weekend, saying quote, uh, saying quote, with a heavy heart, I regret to say that Rachel has passed away. She passed peacefully Saturday night without pain, and for what and for that we are grateful. She is with God, the angels, and family that have pa- have passed before her, surrounded by infinite love. Or wrote, uh, she was born. Lillis was born on July eighth, nineteen seventy eight, in Niagara Falls, New York, and trained in opera before becoming a voice actor. She lent her voice to the, uh, the roles of Jesse and Misty in the Pokemon TV series for 423 episodes between 1997 and 2015. Uh, She joined the voice cast in the same roles in the 1998 Pokemon, the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back, uh, and then also in the Pokemon and Pokemon, the movie project in 2000s. Uh, her vo- other English languaging voice acting credits uh, for adaptations include the Your Life in April TV series, Hunter x Hunter, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn, and the voice role of Satsuki in the 1992 TV series Guardian of Darkness. So definitely a heavy, heavy loss for, you know, Pokemon fans and, and even children who aren't maybe that necessarily big into Pokemon these days because... The game obviously exploded onto the scene in 1996, 1997, but the anime took it, you know, to borrow the phrase from Dragon Ball Z, even further beyond and was one of the first characters on screen. I can remember as a kid being aware of like, is there something going on between her and Ash? Like, is there is there a a love interest going on between these two? And and. Did a fantastic role as Misty. Did a fantastic role as Jesse. Found out she even did the voice of Jigglypuff in the, in the animated series. So mm. anytime you go back and watch those, especially God, Jigglypuff showing up every other episode in those early seasons, uh, you know, where Jigglypuff would sound, show up and sing. That was her singing the song, which incredible voice, incredible talent, and definitely one that one that's uh, that that sucks and, and hurts to lose but may she rest in peace and, and thoughts and prayers to her for her entire family yeah our deepest condolences out to her family friends and fans all over the world yeah uh then moving on to some uh, trailer news because we had a couple trailers drop today do you want to start with the good or the bad oh let's get the good out of the way because the bad's gonna be yeah uh so the first good one was we got a trailer for the upcoming season two of the lord of the rings rings of power it is coming out on uh, prime video on august 29th and i gotta say Looks pretty good. You know, obviously we're dealing with Sauron and people know who he's running around these days. Uh, If you're a fan of the lore and you're a fan of more than just the movies, boy, you can pick up a few things on this trailer. Uh, Celebrimbor being one of them. Oh, boy. Uh, We also do know that uh, I, from uh, various reports, uh, Tom Bombadil, the fan favorite character who unfortunately never made it into the original movies, uh, was planned for. Never, never made it in there, though. Uh, He'll be showing up in this upcoming season, but this season. Does look real good. And we can't forget, we do have a Balrog lurking in the background. Yes, we do. <laughs> oh, we got that. But then we got to get into the bad. And Christ almighty. This man. is a fan film. This, this is bad. This, this, is, this is not real. Uh, we did get a trailer, and I think it's the first trailer, for the upcoming uh, film Craven the Hunter, R-rated movie, uh, coming out this December. This just looks like a steaming pile of shit. Like, I know that they spent an an. an unusual amount of time and reshoots it didn't help i i get the feeling with this movie that all of the action sequences and all the good parts in this movie are in this trailer it, it just doesn't look good I, i'll say this my only experience with the craven character has been from the spider-man animated tv series in the 90s they at least nailed that voice yeah i don't know what's going on here this just looked bad uh, not not my cup of Java. Um, nope. Somebody got killed with a bear claw <laughs> trap. <laughs> yeah, that did happen. Reasons, folks. Yeah, that did happen. Uh, then lastly, certainly not least, we got a little bit of an update on a possible Terminator project. And no, I'm not talking about the anime that's uh, either on or coming to Netflix very soon. I forget when that's coming out. Uh, but this involves James Cameron. Uh, and he did reveal that he is developing a quote classified project within the Terminator franchise. Uh, you know, it's uh, he says it's separate from the ongoing projects, you know, Terminator Zero. But what it is, we don't know. Is it a new movie? Maybe he really hasn't had too much to do uh, with the Terminator franchise since you know Terminator Two. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I realize he gets credit for being a producer on uh, Terminator uh, Dark Fate 
but really in, in the research and the information I was digging up, it seems like all he really did for that movie was one, get Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie. Yeah. Because, hey, they're friends. Eh, understandably so. Uh, but then, two, really coming up with the concept and the idea behind Terminator uh, Dark Fate. So in terms of the – because, like, I know he's got a story by credit, but it's really just from the information I, I found online. You know, he kind of came up and helped come up with the overall, you know, shell of the story that, like, you know, it, it's a spinoff and it's an alternate timeline from Terminator 2 – so, uh, John Connor dies, Sarah Connor goes on and then it's a female Terminator, but she's like half human, half Terminator. So hasn't really had too much to do with it. You know, the last couple of decades. So we'll see what comes out of this might be nothing. James Cameron, slightly busy dude these days, as we alluded to last segment. Yeah, a little bit. So this is definitely interesting. To keep an eye on, yeah. uh, can, you know, like I say, Terminator is usually pretty solid. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's all I got for this week. So let's get into some comic picks, and because uh, obviously it's new comic book day. We do. Uh, so the first uh, thing I'm going to be picking up at the comic book uh, comic shop this week from DC Comics Action Comics issue number 1068, written by Gail Simone. Crushing it right now. Uh, our, the description of this is: Things go cosmically wrong as Superman finds himself in the champion in a galactic b- uh, battle between two. Alien empires. The entire Earth is held hostage as Superman fights to save continents uh, from utter destruction. Loads of guest stars, but you haven't seen them in a very long time. All this and lots more in part two of Superman and the challenge from the stars. Plus, Lois Lane, editor-in-chief. Sidelines reporter Clark Kent. Will their marriage survive tough love? Probably. Listen, they listen to St. Marvel and... Uh, Spider-Man. We'll get to that in a goddamn minute. Yeah. Uh, then also from the folks over at DC, just because I love a good alternate universe story. I love a good what if story. Well, what happened? You know, uh, you know, if if uh, Han Solo didn't find Luke Skywalker and Hoth, what ha- what would have happened if uh, uh, the droids never made it to Luke Skywalker and uh, the original Star Wars? A good story like that. But this is from the DC Vault: Death in the Family. Robin Lives, issue number two from J.M. DeMattis. Quote, over 30, and then the description says, over 30 years ago, history was made when fans voted to kill the second Robin, Jason Todd. Now, DC continues the alternate story of what would have happened if he had lived. Jason Todd, traumatized after the Joker's near-fatal attack, struggles to step back into Robin's shoes, while Batman questions the very need for a younger partner by his side. Has Joker killed Robin after all? When tragedy strikes again in the form of the mind-bending scarecrow, how do our heroes find their way back, especially with Copperhead on the loose and the Joker on the run? I love the art style, at least on the cover. It's got that, like... Yeah, it's a throwback. It's got that throwback cover, and also some interesting stuff they got going on there. Uh, Then I got to recommend two of the three issues I reviewed for Nerd Initiative this week. Uh, We'll get to why I'm not recommending the third here in a minute, but the two I am recommending, uh, first of which is Ultimates issue number three from Dennis Camp. This one says, introducing the She-Hulk, the ultimate search uh, for a means of destroying the maker's most powerful pawn, the Hulk. And in the process, they uncover an army of Hulks hidden away from the world with She-Hulk at the helm. This issue is awesome. This issue is very adult in nature, and I'm not talking like, ew, some, you know, uh, I'm talking like gruesome. Like, there is some stuff that it's like some real implications there, and it's very good. It's very very well worth the read, and you should definitely check this out this week and add it to your pull list. I mean, this is Dennis Camp, so, I mean, if you're uh-huh. a 20th century man, you kind of know what you're jumping into. Uh-huh. Uh, then you've got Star Wars uh, Darth Vader, issue number 49 from Greg Pak. Uh, this one says, Imperial Schism nears its thrilling climax. Luke Skywalker faces the full might of the Schism Imperial. Sly Moore makes his, the biggest choice of her life. The Markor uh, gains the upper hand, and Darth Vader confronts the consequences of his ruthless quest for unlimited power. A lot, lot of build up with this one. We're building to a climax. We're building to issue 50 of this uh, Darth Vader uh, uh, comic line. Definitely one you got to check out this week. A very good issue this week. And then we get to the not so good. Uh, you might want to give a description, a disclaimer on this. Thoughts, views, and opinions of that are Padawan J do not reflect the ODPH or Nerd Initiative in any way, shape, or form. Listener discretion is advised. So the other one I had to review this week is for Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 55 from Zeb Wells. Uh, and this one it reads, quote, The last arc nearly killed Spider-Man. Others weren't so lucky. Peter hopes to take a breath, but gets a new challenge to face in this. The 949th issue, legacy issue of Amazing Spider-Man. This is the last domino to fall as we head into the next big centennial. So 
this issue is, I don't, I'm going to tell you right now up front, do not buy this issue at the comic shops this week. If, if you're, if it's in your pull list, I'm so sorry for you because you will have wasted $5 buying this issue. If you were thinking of, like I said, if you were thinking of buying this issue this week, save your five bucks, buy something else, buy literally anything else, because this issue is without question, hands down the worst comic book I have ever read in my entire life. Wow. You're, I realize, you know, the next issue is Legacy to 950. You know, huge mon, ma, milestone moment for them. Very good. But this run by Zeb Wells is quite honestly the worst run in Spider-Man history. Because you would think, and, and the other thing to keep in mind, Zeb Wells' run is coming to an end here very soon. Very soon. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of issues. I want to say at this point there's like five or six issues left. Give take, yeah. I think he, I think he's going to sixty. So counting this one, you know, five left, but not counting this one because it's out. Four. It's, it's a tombstone arc, yeah. Yeah, uh, four more. This issue is an insult to even call it filler. Wow. Because I'll, I'll give the spoiler up front. He goes on a date with with a woman. Uh, the date goes about as well as you'd well as you'd expect. That it's their third attempt trying to go on this date, but obviously him being Spider Man, his duties have gotten in the way. But he goes on this date. He shows up without shoes because he got stuck fighting Stilt Man. There's a new Stilt Man. You never see him. You never see the fight. But he's he's mid travel to meet up with this date. He's already hilariously late. Shows up and and there's this whole back and forth of you know the girl doesn't think he wants to be there and no he wants to be there. She's like I'm getting you have a second family vibes. You know I don't think this is gonna work. And then Rhino and Screwball show up. And they're terrorizing, and he gets distracted. I gotta save the city, and he tells the girl, "I gotta leave. I'm sorry." And and she before he walks out of the hotel or not the hotel, the restaurant, which even for Peter it looks like it's out of his price range. Sorry, but it's New York, and it's a very very classy restaurant. Uh, which also side note, the the freaking waiter looks like Alfred from Batman. Tell me I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I showed you the image. Yeah, he looks like him. But he goes, he goes to leave and the girl tells her, hey, you know what? Don't even, you know, this isn't going to work. Let's not, let's not try this again. Let's just move on. And he goes out and he gets ready to put his suit on and fight the bad guys. And he decides he's going to do something else. He goes up to him in his street clothes and then, and then says, hey, guys, can you just not? I'm on a date. I'm on my third date with this girl. I screwed up the first two. You know, you guys... You're just and now, mind you, he has not revealed he's Spider Man. He's still in his Peter Parker street clothes. Mm -hmm. He's like, you guys are really ruining this for me. I'm screwing up this date again. Can you guys just not? And Screwball goes, you know what? I understand. I'm on the dating apps too. I know how hard it is. We'll 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 give you a pass. We'll we'll stop. And they stop fighting because Peter uh, reasoned with them, going, please stop. I'm on a date. And he goes back to the date and he tells the girl, listen, this is where I want to be. I want to be with you. I want to kiss you. And they kiss and they decide, you know what? We're going to need a second menu because the girl figured, hey, you know what? I'm here. I need dinner. I'm going to have dinner anyway. They get a second and then they get a second menu and then they decide to eat or order some food. And the issue ends with Screwball and Rhino watching from a rooftop across the street while they set up Rhino for a dating profile on an app. And that's the whole issue. Mm. So if you were expecting anything good, anything like earth shattering or monumental to set up the final arc of Zeb Wells run. You're not honest to God. Don't get this issue. Skip the issue. Get 950. Although I'd say even at that point, wait and see what some of the reviews online are saying, because this issue is just a steaming pile of garbage that I cannot recommend it in any way, shape or form. Padawan J folks. I mean, I, I'm not even going to go near that one because, like I say, the, the current run is not doing... It's the worst Spider-Man run of all time. ...doing anything for me. After Gang War, I was kind of... I dipped out. I'm just like, not my cup of java. But stuff that I do like to talk about, Transformers number 11, the uh, Energon universe is really shaping up, and Daniel Warren Johnson and, and Jorge Corona are definitely crushing it right now. Very cool issue. Uh, a lot of high emotions running in this one, so definitely one to keep an eye out for at the comic shop. Also, another one that is very intense, and you know, it's it's a really creative story by one of Pad's favorite writers, Jerry Dugan. Hey, falling in love on the path to hell. 
Oh, boy. So the uh, most unique love story in all of comics takes another drastic turn, uh, and stuff goes down. I'm, I'm not even going to, uh, like, spoil the lead on it. It's a very cool issue. Uh, some parts a little tough mm-hmm. to deal with because, well, you're in purgatory, and, you know, when you're dealing on the path to hell, you're not exactly meeting some good people. So just kind of keep that in mind. Also, uh, another great pick the coming from Marvel Comics, a friend of the show, Jason Lowe. Uh, Werewolf by Night number one. Hey. So this is him and Sergio Dalavia. I uh, really going into some places with Jack Russell, the original Werewolf by Night. Uh, this is under the red band at Marvel, so it is not exactly uh, one for kids, but it's definitely one that is entertaining, and I love how they set up uh, two classic villains in there, too. Mm. So. Last but certainly not least on me, uh, Valiant Comics. Uh, you know me. I always got a soft spot for Valiant. Ninjak vs. Roku number three. Uh, very interesting take they do with the the, story, the characters in this one. So very fun issue. If you like a lot of action, this one's going to be right up your alley. And I know Valiant is getting geared up for the resurgence of the Valiant universe. So uh, I wouldn't doubt we talk a little bit more about that in the uh, upcoming weeks. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And for more, even more comic reviews, nerdinitiative.com has got you with over 25 reviews currently on the site, I believe. It might be up to 30 at this point. Uh, nobody does a new comic book day like Nerd Initiative, and there's nothing better than going to your local comic book shops and going to pick up some issues. That being said, for anything and everything, this is the ODPH. You can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for entertainment this week. So for the one only, Pat one j Thank you, thank you. I honestly thought you were going to say F Spider-Man. Uh, I'm your host, Ken. Thank you as always listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time.